Have you ever heard the words, your sins are forgiven? What was that like for you? For me, it was February of 1989 when I feel that I truly understood the significance of those words in a personal way for the first time. A college campus minister shared the gospel with me. I came to a point of believing that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he rose again from the dead to give me a new and eternal life, and it was something that I realized I desperately needed. And then in the spring of 1989, a couple months later, it was about a month later or maybe six weeks later, something in that period, I was sitting in my dorm room and listening to a message that he had given me to listen to, and uh, the message was talking about our sinfulness, and it was talking about God's forgiveness. And, and though I had come to understand that and believe it, the message led those truths to sink in in an even deeper, more personal, even more profound way, so much so that I found myself on the floor of my dorm room weeping my eyes out in thankfulness, really. Really. Yes, some sadness at, at, and sorrow for my sinfulness, but really a profound just thankfulness that I could be forgiven, that I indeed was forgiven of my sins. I appreciated much more deeply the depth of God's love and forgiveness for me. Have you heard the words, your sins are forgiven? What was that like for you? If you have heard those words, this morning's message will, I pray, make you appreciate much more deeply the depth of God's love and forgiveness for you. If you haven't heard these words or just haven't yet come to a place where they've become personally applied to your life, then this morning's message is also for you. For perhaps this very morning, you will hear and experience the wonderful good news and hear and experience Jesus saying to you, your sins are forgiven. So let's look at this morning's passage where, where we see Jesus saying these exact words. Here in Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26, before we look at the, the passage, let's pray and ask God to teach us. Lord, thanks that you want us to, to know what has happened here, uh, not just for this individual, but how that also relates to us who read it today. And thank you for what you have done to change people's lives like this man's here, uh, but also the way you can do that for us and the way you have for many of us. So, Lord, we thank you. And we ask that you teach us. We ask that you would transform us. We ask that you would use your word today in a very profound way in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 15, 17 through 26, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus." And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the, friend, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with all, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Well, in this passage, you saw the words Jesus proclaims to the man, your sins are forgiven you. So let's look at seven points in this passage pertaining to Jesus proclaiming 
that important truth that your sins are forgiven. Seven points in this passage pertaining to Jesus' proclamation, your sins are forgiven. Point one, the first is Jesus teaches the teachers. Our passage begins with the phrase on one of those days. And, and, and I, that, that stood out to me as I was preparing this because it provides a parallel with the previous section so far in chapter 5. So, for example, look back at chapter 5, verse 1. It began with the phrase, on one occasion. And then look down at the beginning of the next section that Mason covered last week in verse 12. It marked the beginning of a section where Jesus heals the leper, and it begins with the phrase, while he was in one of the cities. And now we come to a new section that begins simply with the phrase, on one of those days. And what Luke is doing is he's not giving us an exact date. It's not like Friday, you know, October or whatever of zero, well, I guess it would be what, like 30 AD. Well, he didn't do that. He, he, just, he, he doesn't give us an exact date. But what he does is he places this event within the overall context of the early ministry days of Jesus in the region of Galilee. And it's on one of these days that Luke mentions Jesus' teaching. Not a whole lot surprised right there. I mean, teaching was foundational to Jesus' ministry. We saw uh, early on in Jesus' ministry as he very much is at the very beginning of it that he said in Luke 4.15 that teaching, he expressed that teaching was part of what he was, had come to do. What's noteworthy, what's noteworthy here in chapter 5 in this passage is, is a specific group of people who are in the audience listening to this teaching. And Luke chooses to highlight these folks. Luke specifically mentions that the Pharisees and teachers of the law, also known as scribes, are there. They're sitting there. And he, he says they've come from all over the place. They've come from every village of Galilee and even from Judea and from Jerusalem down at the the center of all the religious history and activity. Who are the Pharisees and teachers of the law? Well, they're the Jewish religious leadership. The Pharisees mentioned by name here were the most influential among the religious leadership. The teachers of the law are another group also known as the scribes. And both Pharisees and scribes are the experts. They're the, they, they know the word of God. They know all of the religious laws, and their job was to make sure that people were applying them. And, of course, we know, as Jesus will interact with them in the Gospels, we know from other Gospels, we know very much from Luke's Gospels, we'll see more and more that a lot of times they, they, they had added a bunch of extra rules and regs that they had kind of come up with. In their zeal to be religious and to be serious, committed followers of God, they added a lot of things that weren't even things that God required. But generally speaking, they were respected as the authorities, as the, 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 the ones that would make sure that the doctrine lined up, to make sure that people were following what the will of God was. But what we see here is the teachers are being taught by Jesus. Imagine someone who's considered the world's most eminent scholar in a specific field of study. Just imagine someone like that for a moment. And then imagine somebody else comes along and is teaching this person, not just this person, but every other expert in that field of study. And you get an idea of what is going on here. Jesus is teaching not one, but a multitude of teachers. And we know there's a whole bunch of them here because they've come from all over. And we know that the crowds are so great that the, the people couldn't bring their friend in to Jesus, so they had to go up on a roof. There's a whole lot of teachers here that have come to hear Jesus. So on one sense, it's good. They're, they're here, it seems maybe, to, to be taught. But on the other hand, these religious leaders weren't necessarily approaching this situation with a lot of humility and teachability as if, this guy really is someone we can learn from. They're there more to kind of see if this guy uh, lines up, you know, if, if this guy is going to be teaching something that lines up with the scriptures. Does it really line up with the law? Does it, does it, is it appropriate or is this some kind of heretical false thing that we need to warn everybody about? Dr. David Powell writes this in his commentary on Luke, and I quote, 
referring to the Pharisees and, and, uh, and scribes here, they were, they were respected as having expert knowledge of the details of Jewish legal tradition and so would be expected to form an opinion about the correctness of Jesus' teaching. Is it correct or is it not? That's what they were really there for. Well, Jesus' teaching is correct, but these teachers are here to assess this. They are looking, perhaps even skeptically, for errors in Jesus' teaching that they can expose and correct. Yet in this teaching, Jesus is, is, is really going to be teaching these teachers. He's going to show them important truths about who he is and what he can do. This brings us to the second point in this passage. Jesus possesses the power of the Lord. In setting the context of the passage, Luke, Luke tells us next, in a way that foreshadows what is to come, that not only is Jesus teaching the teachers, but also that the power of the Lord was with him to heal. That phrase, the power of the Lord was with him to heal, is designed to show that the very presence of God, the power of God, through the Holy Spirit, is with Jesus in his ministry. It, it might be tempting to think that this suggests that the power of the Lord to heal kind of came and went, like it just showed up at particular moments, but that, that's not the idea here. No, it's simply to show us that Jesus, in his ministry, has the presence and power of God to heal with him. And that was something that perpetually he had. It foreshadows that he's about to utilize his presence and power to heal in a few moments in this passage. So that brings us to the third point. A paralyzed man is brought by his friends to Jesus. We next hear, starting in verse 18, about some men bringing a paralyzed man on a bed to Jesus. Dr. Powell writes that this man, like the leper in the previous passage, would be considered an outcast unable to fully participate in the worship community of Israel. But how do these friends treat this man? Not as an outcast. They're eager for him to get some help, and they, they believe that the help can come to him through Jesus. How will these friends treat this man? How will Jesus treat him? What does it take to approach God? Do you have to have it all together? Do you have to be without an infirmity like leprosy or being paralyzed, you, you, you can't have that? And, you know, is that, is that the rule? <clears throat> but these friends have hope. And, and they think that perhaps through Jesus, there can be an improvement in this man's situation. And, and, and perhaps he can completely come before God. But the crowds are such, you know, the religious leaders are from all over the region, even from Jerusalem, that they can't, they can't get near Jesus. So they come up with a plan. Hey, guys, let's go up on top of the roof. Yeah, pull him up. So they go up to the roof, and they bring the man up there on the bed, and they remove portions of the roof and lower the man on his bed down through the roof right in the midst of Jesus while he's teaching. It would be as if these tiles opened up and somebody dropped somebody. Not that I could heal them, but, you know, it's like in the midst of him teaching a, a, a group of people, you know, it's like it's hard not to be interrupted in your speech <laughs> when everybody's now looking at this. This man's being dropped down right in the midst of, of Jesus' teaching. And again, he's, he's teaching the religious leaders, especially. So you, you would think, like, that would be pretty radical. It's like... Talk about decorum and formality, and that's being all thrown aside for a moment. You know, you're giving an important TED talk somewhere, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the most important people in that field of study are there, and all of a sudden, here comes this apparent interruption, right? So all eyes are on this man, and I'm sure Jesus literally stopped his speech, his, his teaching, and what does Jesus do? That brings us to our fourth point. Jesus says, <laughs> I, I mean, there, there's not really much indication of him saying much else. It's not that there weren't a few other things said, but 
Luke cuts straight to the point that indicates pretty early on in his interaction with this man, Jesus just says, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> That's what the religious leaders did. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. And we know from the context that that's likely their reaction. Verse 20 begins telling us that initially Jesus' response is one of noticing and seeing their faith. It says that he notices their, plural, notice it's plural, that seems to be referring to the group of the friends who have lowered this man down. Though the comment is initially directed to the paralytic's friends for their faith, that doesn't mean that the paralytic himself didn't have faith as well. Indeed, he does be because of what is demonstrated in a few moments. But after noticing and commending the man's friends for their faith, and likely again this man, Jesus makes a powerful pronouncement directly to the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. It may seem strange that Jesus comments on the man's spiritual condition when his infirmity is a very physical one of being paralyzed. And he, and he seems to be there primarily for that, outwardly, it would seem. But this pronouncement by Jesus isn't meant to emphasize that the man's sin itself was the reason for his paralysis. Some would read into that and say, okay, well, if he said your sins are forgiven, then that means his paralysis must be because of his own personal sin, as if God you know, kind of zapped him with that because he deserved it. No, that's, that's, not, that's not what the message is here. No, no it, it doesn't seem at all to be his fault necessarily or his responsibility that he's paralyzed. No, Jesus is taking the outward physical condition and, and it's being used as a parable to point to the inward greater spiritual need that he, and by implication all of us have, and that's a need for our sins to be forgiven. And I think he wanted everybody in that room, even these religious leaders who seem to have it all together, they follow the, the law and make sure everybody else does to the, the, the dot and, and, and T, the cross, dot your I's, cross your T's, all that stuff. Jesus referred to it in the Sermon on the Mount as every jot and tittle of the law. I think it was in the Sermon on the Mount he said that. But, you know, it, it's, it's to, it, it becomes very much this acted out parable in a way that is to imply that all of us need this. All of us, in a sense, are spiritually like a paralytic. Like a paralytic is physically unable, we're spiritually unable to have our sins forgiven without God. And so Jesus gets to the heart of his greatest need. That's the forgiveness of sin that he needs and that by implication all people need. And, and Well, when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, it understandably elicits rumblings. Remember I said they probably went, you know, they've got these internal questions among the scribes and Pharisees. It says here, in their minds and hearts. And what Jesus will say in a few moments seems to indicate that they didn't necessarily express these outwardly. They weren't necessarily actually, you know, talking a lot to each other as much as they were inwardly having these thoughts. And Jesus is able to discern and know what's going on in their minds and hearts and that brings us to the fifth point in this passage pertaining to Jesus' proclamation that your sins are forgiven. And that's the objections of the scribes and Pharisees. They have objections. And again, I think these seem to be internal. What were the Pharisees thinking in their minds and hearts after Jesus said to the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you? Jesus knows. He knows what's going on in their minds and hearts, and he tells them so. Verse 21, Jesus lets the scribes and Pharisees know that he knows what they are questioning. So he goes ahead and Jesus says it. He says it for him. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? And who can forgive sins but God alone? And that must have right there showed them some things, some more things about who Jesus is. Like, oh, he just read our minds. It's like, do, are we showing this on our face? What's going on here? But no, he discerned exactly what they were thinking. He knows these are their objections. And they view Jesus' proclamation of the man's forgiveness of sins being, being either one of two things. Either, either this is something, because this is, either, this is really God, because only God can do this. Or this man is speaking blasphemous stuff, and we need to, we need to take this guy out. And, and that's not to dinner. That's, let's get rid of him, because that was a stonable offense where they would stone people. 
and, and these uh, religious leaders would be the ones to some, that typically would make that call. They would decide that, whether a person should be stoned or not for violating, again, the standards of the law. So the scribes and Pharisees are asking actually the right questions internally. Who can do this but God alone? Either he's God or uh, this man speaking something blasphemous in saying your sins are forgiven. Now, it seems as if they're, they're leaning towards what Jesus has done as blasphemous. But it highlights for us the real issue. Jesus, if, if merely he's a man, he is being blasphemous. But if Jesus is really able to forgive sins, then because only God alone can do it, then, then Jesus really is God. So they're internally considering the right questions. Unfortunately, they were, it seems, assuming the worst, not the best. They, they are likely landing, at least initially, on the conclusion that Jesus was merely a man and therefore was committing blasphemy. It, it seems as if they're filled with these objections, but they don't do anything right there on the spot. I think there's still a little bit in such, and the passage indicates us that everyone is in awe at the end. So I, I think they're a little just like so shocked by what's going on right in front of them that they haven't even, they haven't even talked to each other or consulted yet to where they've said, yeah, we need to stone this guy. You know, but, but they are, they're, they're stunned. And it, it, again, it seems as if they're leaning towards that their objections are more inclined to say, okay, this is likely just a man. He's committing blasphemies. He can't do this, at least initially. But how does Jesus respond to them? Well, that brings us to our sixth point. Jesus answers the objections and he heals the paralytic. Now they're really going to be stunned. Verse 22, as I mentioned a few moments ago, makes it clear that Jesus knows what the religious leaders were thinking. He asked them, why do you question in your hearts? And then Jesus asked them, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or to say, rise and walk. Now, what, does this, what do these questions mean? What does this question that has two questions in it mean? Well, the question is implying that it's easier, in a sense, to say your sins are forgiven you than to say, rise and walk. But how is that easier? You might be running that as you read this passage. Like, what, what does he mean by it's easier? I mean, wouldn't forgiving of sins be a much more profound miracle than healing a paralytic? But Jesus says it's easier. How or in what sense is this easier to say your sins are forgiven than to say rise and take up your, your, your bed and go home? What Jesus is getting at here is to say that your sins are forgiven is, an e is easier because there's no other way that other people could necessarily empirically prove that the man's sins really were forgiven. In other words, if Jesus was a charlatan, if he was just some kind of like false teacher trying to get a bunch of followers, trying to do some kind of magic trick, he could say your sins are forgiven and nobody could really necessarily know that for sure because no one else can really see truly into the spiritual condition of a, of a person's heart. The man could jump around and say, yeah, I really feel forgiven, and he's forgiven me. But nobody could really empirically prove it, right? Furthermore, it would, in a sense, be harder to say, rise and walk, because the man's really paralyzed. People know that, and if he actually gets up and starts walking, that shows us that Jesus isn't merely a man. He's done something incredibly miraculous here. And if, if he can heal him outwardly physically, then certainly, because only God alone could do that and only God could forgive sins, certainly the outward physical healing of his paralytic condition could show the reality of the inward healing of the spiritual condition. So Jesus is posing these questions to them to consider more deeply and more profoundly who Jesus really is and what he is really capable of doing. And then he actually demonstrates it. Verse 24 
Jesus says to the religious leaders, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and then he turns to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. What happens? And how do the people respond? This brings us to our seventh and final point, the amazement and the awe of all. The man responds, and, and his response definitely demonstrates that he has faith and trust that Jesus can do this. He gets up, he picks up what he was laying upon, and, and he, he goes home. And he's glorifying God as he does. Verse 25 says that the man responded immediately. That's hope, that's faith. It's not like, gee, let me think about it. Are you sure you could really do this? You know, I'm mean, kind of embarrassing in front of all these people. You know, I mean, I've been paralyzed my whole life. No, he just does immediately what Jesus tells him to do. And it works. The miracle is demonstrated immediately after Jesus said, rise, the man rises. He gets up, he takes what he's lying upon, and he goes home, and he's glorifying God as he does so. That means that this man clearly knows that it's God who's done this. That Jesus isn't merely a man. He's glorifying God. He knows that it's God at work in this situation. And since Jesus was the one to do it, it must be Jesus who is God. So this tells us a lot about who Jesus truly is. That's how the man responds. Well, how, how does everybody else respond? They're in amazement. They are, they are absolutely in amazement and awe, it says. Everybody's amazed. It's, the word used is seized them all. The amazement seized them I love that. The amazement takes complete control. The amazement takes over. So I don't think they're thinking about stoning Jesus right now. Uh, you know, again, otherwise I think they might have started to do it. They're just, they're just so amazement what they're, they're just like a deer in headlights. They're stunned, shocked, jaw dropped. What have we just witnessed here? And, and I think internally they're, they're starting to realize that, okay, if he can physically heal this man's paralysis, then perhaps what he said when he said your sins are forgiven, perhaps he is really able to do that. Now, I think the more and more they thought about that, because like, we know the opposition continues later throughout the gospel, they, they, you know, and eventually they're out to have Jesus put to death. So I don't think they, they stayed there with that belief, but I think they're pondering it. Because it says everyone is filled with awe. It sees them. The amazement sees them. And it says they all glorify God. They're filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today that they can't doubt that at the very least they've witnessed an act of God. Well, what are we to take from this passage? Four things. At least four things. There's probably more that we could take, but here's at least four things for us. Number one, Jesus has all power and authority because Jesus is God. He has the power to heal. He can heal all physical infirmities, even paralysis. He has power and authority because Jesus is God. He has power to heal the spiritual infirmity of sin that we all have. Second, I think an application here is to say we, we, we all need friends. That's not the main point of the passage but the friends get a lot of attention in this passage. Jesus commends them for their faith. They go out of their way to help this paralytic man who is considered an outcast, and, and they do whatever it takes to get him before Jesus. They, they you know, in front of a, a crowd of religious leaders of all people, they break the quorum, they go up on a roof, they tear the roof apart to lower this man down. I mean, it's incredible faith, and it just shows us that, that God uses other people in our lives. And it shows us the place that we all can have to help other people in terms of encouraging them or helping them in their faith journey. So the, the paralytic friends here, they're not the ones that saved the paralytic. Jesus was. But God used his friends to get him in to Jesus' presence. So I think there's implications for us. You know, have good friends. 
Take the time to build relationships because God may use them in your life. But there's also implications for us to be those kinds of friends to other people. Are you praying for people? Are you helping people get closer to Jesus? Are you looking for tangible ways that you can help people get close to Jesus? Do you invite people to church or places where they can encounter Jesus and come to know him and to experience Jesus as it seems happened right here? Three, you can't read this passage and not consider this question, do you have faith in Jesus? Do you personally? Jesus commended the faith of the friends, but I, again, I think the, the commendation also relates to the man himself because clearly the man had faith too. He responds immediately and he's healed and, and, and Jesus, the fact that Jesus actually does heal him indicates that his sins actually are being forgiven. So clearly the man's faith was present and a gift from God. But do you have faith in Jesus? Would Jesus commend your faith? Quick little thing on faith here. It's not, you know, it's not like the amount of faith that you have. It's the object of your faith. Let me say that again. It's not the amount of faith you have. It's the one you're putting your faith in. It's the object of it, Jesus. That's where the power is. The power is not in you trying to stir up more and more and more faith. The power is in the person, Jesus, that you're placing your faith in. That's how we have great faith. The great faith comes not from us, it's, it's from God. And yes, it's, it flows from the object of who he is and his personhood. And that yes, that can lead to responses of greater reliance upon God, greater trust in God, greater sense of taking steps of faith and trust and, and, and risk even. But it's not ultimately about what you do. It's about the person you're placing your faith in. The one who alone has the authority to forgive sins. And this brings us to our last application, number four. Do you know that if you have faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven? Do you know that if you've been given the gift of faith that God's given you because your faith is in the person of who Jesus is, if you've received that, you have faith in that, you trust in that because God's given you that grace, then your sins are forgiven. I asked you at the beginning of this message in my introduction, have, have you heard those words, your sins are forgiven? And the most important person in the world to say those words to you is God himself. And God himself does say that to you in his word. So if you have received that, you have heard those words, and that means your sins are forgiven. I, I've asked people before, okay, have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? And they'll say yes. And then I love to ask the follow-up question, do, do you feel forgiven? And do you know what most people say? No. At least if they're fresh off of something that they know is sinful. So I'll ask him again, well, does, let's read what the scripture says here. Does it say your sins are forgiven? Have you confessed your sins to God? Have you turned to him and trusted him? They'll say, yeah, it says that my sins are forgiven. I said, I fall again, so, so do you feel forgiven? Well, well, maybe a little more than I did a few seconds ago. I'm just like, read it again. You know, and I, I have him read it because that's what my mentor did with me. Um, I was, I, like, it, was, it was almost like he talked to me from like, 50-50 up to, he wouldn't let me go. He was, well, he didn't leave. It was my dorm room. But he's like, he, 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 it was probably about a 10-minute exchange. Um, he was like, how sure of you that your sins are forgiven? I said, I'm 50-50 now. He said, no, read it again. And I read it again. It says, if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved and our sins, means our sins are forgiven, right? And, and so he had me read that until I got up to, I think I said 99.99 because it sounded overly presumptuous to be 100%. He's like, yeah, you can be 100%. You can have that trust in the word of God that God himself says to you that you have eternal life. That it literally says that he wrote these things to you who believe so that you may know that you have eternal life, 1 John 5, 11 through 14. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Do you have the son? I say, yeah, I have the son. Then what's true of you? You have eternal life. By implication, your sins are forgiven. 
Jesus is saying to you today, your sins, not some of them, not most of them, but all of them, your sins are forgiven. God, thank you. Who are we? Who are we to deserve that? We do not. We are all like the paralytic. Spiritually, we are separated from you apart from Jesus. We can't change ourselves. We can't make ourselves right. There's nothing that we can do apart from your healing touch and your healing power, your words that say your sins are forgiven. We thank you that you paid it all when you went to the cross, that on the cross as you took upon yourself the sin of the world, and as the, the just judgment and penalty for our sin was poured out on you instead of us, and as it paid for, and as you breathed up your last before you did, you said, it is finished. But you did not stay dead, Lord. On the third day you rose, conquering sin and death. And as you've been resurrected to new life, you give us who believe in you, who have turned to you in true faith, to receive the gift of your love and forgiveness through what you've done, you give us the forgiveness of sins, a relationship with you, an eternal life, a new life. So help us to live in light of that. And thank you for giving us such incredible love and grace through Jesus. And we pray in his name, amen.